what's up y'all well here we are i mean me and drew drew dollars show is on a plane or soon will be um so just flying what's solo but for two people duo was that flying duo flying duo this week i guess that's um, how you fly usually though yeah i don't know they got just two pilots how many pilots they got up there at least two. There's two. There's the pilot and the co-pilot, right? Yeah. There's you no know how many times I've got to go to the bathroom on recent flights, right? And it happens to be when the pilots go to the bathroom, which people don't know that's a whole thing. I didn't Me realize too. that either, but there's a whole process involved when a pilot needs to take a shit or a piss. And it's uh, they got procedures and whatnot, probably ever since that one pilot uh, locked himself in the cockpit and killed everybody on the plane and himself, I guess. But yeah, it's uh, frustrating when you also need to pay because they won't let you stand up there. They make you get away. Because like you might attack the pilot plus the doors yeah, right. open. They take the drink cart and they put it in front of the, they block, they block the bathroom with the drink cart and they post up a flight attendant by yeah. the drink cart and all Which this is shit. hilarious because yeah. it's a safety precaution. And I guess an unruly asshole, especially with all the stuff going on with people fighting over masks I get it, but if you're talking about an actual terrorist and you think a 40-pound yeah. uh, drink cart and a 110-pound, you know, Julie is going to stop my man from getting in there with his knife or whatever he's stuck in in his shoe. Yeah, that take more than one Julie, that's for sure. Uh, so, all right, everybody, listen up. Go to uh, wellreadcomedy.com. If you want to see tickets to our upcoming shows, we're still at it. We stay at it. Uh, we got uh, Illinois this weekend, Springfield, and then Chicago. And then we'll be in Omaha, Indiana, Appleton, Wisconsin. Not these are not necessarily in order. Knoxville, Portland, Louisville, a bunch of places. So go uh, go check it out. Well, yeah, we are comment. coming to your town, and if you don't see it, we'll get there soon. Um, I don't think you skipped anybody. You might have skipped right. like one. Okay. Well, yeah, feeling pretty good about it. We'll see y'all out there. Uh, uh, Drew, speaking of out there, you drove across the country twice in recent weeks, didn't you? Like you drove to yeah. Tennessee for the holidays and you drove back to Yeah, we left, uh, we left at the end of November sometime. I don't remember exact date. And we drove to New Orleans for our show there. And everybody that came out, thank you. That was a great time. And then we just kept trucking on to Tennessee. Um I knew we were going to have to be in town for the special. We always obviously do Zanies right before Christmas. For those who don't know, we filmed our our first 30-minute specials on tape. Um, great time. Everybody involved was awesome. Everybody who came out was awesome. Thank you. Anyway, I had all that going on. I was like, screw it. We'll just drive. Plus, it's another thing with the flights. So, first of all, the P thing's been happening to me, too, a lot. It's happened to me four times in the last – month and a half or three months maybe and never happened to me before that i remember i'm almost wondering if something changed where they're like they like demanded more bathroom breaks because they're if you notice they go back to back now and it's longer yeah i, I, I mean like i more, never noticed this until it affected me of course and so i, I don't know what was going on previously right. but yeah I seems like pilots are pissing more out here and nobody's talking about it that's what i'm saying maybe they like <laughs> you know had a new contract negotiation and they were like and another thing we want more bathroom breaks mm -hmm. um anyway another thing that's new is it's really hard to fly with your dog it used to be really easy all you had to do was basically say sometimes i feel sad and this dog helps me and i bought a 30 dollar vest off amazon and they yeah. were like okay good for you yes that's not the case anymore because all these assholes abused it with their mm -hmm. peacocks and their pigs. Did you hear that, Dane? No. I, okay. I've also, and it always cracks me up, although I, I do also think it's shitty, but it cracks me up. I've seen dogs in airports that have like those vests on or whatever, just acting like such a little piece of shit, <laughs> you know, just like yapping and dragging at the leash and stuff like that. And just clearly not being a trained <laughs> service animal. And I always think that's so funny, but I'm not, so surprised, funny. I'm not surprised to hear that they're cracking down on that because of, I mean, it's clearly been exploited by people for a long. What, what, do you like before people, can you put them somewhere else? Under I don't the plant. Know. Right. In like a kennel or something. Is that what it's, people used to do? 
I mean, it's not a, you put them in a cage if that's what you mean by kennel. But I think kennel mean kennel's like a jail, like you know, like uh, that's maybe a band, but like a hotel versus a hotel room. Like a kennel, I think is the hotel, not the hotel room. Am I wrong? Oh, I don't know. Whatever the the box, the dog yeah. box. You put them in yeah. a dog box and put them in like a cargo hold or something. Right. And the people don't want to do that, including me and Andy even more strongly than me because it gets really cold in there. And like a lot of elder dogs do in fact die on airplanes like underneath. Okay. Um, right. So but anyway, people, fly do, them with but me. people do that though. Yeah. Or is that, that. Just, is that just a thing that just, that just went, you know, that went, um, that went away. Like a thing no, that people, people realize like, Oh, we should stop doing that. Cause that's fucked up. And so nobody does it anymore. Or people, no, still, I think do people it. still do it. Okay. Did you see it every once in a while? Well, sometimes um, you got to get a dog somewhere else. Right, you, you got to, and you have no choice sometimes. Yeah. And well, the thing about the, what were they calling them? Service, not service animal. What was the word? That emotional was support. The emotional support animals. I knew even when before I ever flew with Mick that people were abusing it with their little yippy dogs or like the dog that wasn't behaving correctly. Now I'm a dog person. I know that I'm biased, but that didn't bother me at all. People abusing it. Then I started abusing it. Of course it didn't bother me after that, but it's one of those. I think this is another example in America of you can break the rules a little bit. And then a bunch of fucking assholes start breaking the rules a lot, either to prove a point or because they're insane because they want to fly with a peacock or whatever it is, or they just like attention. And then it ruins everyone's good time. Like, you know, like you get a little drunk and drive and you like drive off the road, run over somebody's, uh, you know, mailbox. Ah, you know, whatever. Then somebody murders a bunch of kids and it's like, well, now none of us can drive even a little bit drunk. We have to do it. We have to be do it the right way. It's just like people go too far. That's probably an extreme example, but people go too far <laughs> maybe, breaking rules. Maybe slightly extreme, yes. But no, hell, a little drunk driving here and there, you know, what are you going to do? I, I've never been beside a person on a plane who had one of those clearly fake service animal situations going on, but I mean, you know, that would very not hit for me if I ever was. I've, well, I've seen people in airports. Because what? once they get on the, well, a lot of times those yippy dogs, once they get on the plane, they get real quiet because they're nervous around those people. I know with Mick, we pump him full of CBD and he just sleeps the whole time. Like I tried to do it the most polite way. I mean, I guess yeah. that's what I'm getting at. If you're going to kind of be a dick, try to do it in the nicest if way the possible. the dog just lays there and don't do shit, that's fine. I'm talking about if it's being a little asshole while you're on a plane with it. When it when it ain't really supposed to be there in the first place, right? Uh, that well, exactly. That I compare you. that to the to the uh, peacocks and pigs. It, it, it's a it's a different version of the same thing. Are these thing. two like specific examples you've seen in the news or something? Yeah. Like these are two, okay because yeah. you keep saying peacocks and pigs specifically. <laughs> yeah, peacocks and pigs. Everybody knows right. them, uh, but. What you're describing is a lesser version of that, but my point, I think, applies to that, too. Okay, you're kind of breaking the rule here. Pump your dog full of CBD. It is not expensive, and it's better for the dog. Dogs like CBD, and they would be better calm and sleeping on that plane rather than nervous. It's Again, if you're going to be an asshole, be the best version of that asshole you can be, or you'll ruin it for the rest of us assholes. And they've ruined it, and I can't fly with my dog, so we drove. That was long-winded. Yeah, but assholes generally don't, you know, think about <laughs> ruining it for for other people. Not mm -hmm. not at the forefront of their concern. They're mostly just it. like, "This is what would hit for me," and so I'm going to do that. I know and it. It's a real that. problem with my people, and I've been trying to talk to them about it, but they don't want to listen to nobody. That's another issue I've run into. So that's so that Mick is the main reason you decided to drive across the country. Well, we had to be there for a long time. Either way, we cut it. Like three weeks was probably the minimum we were going to get away with. And when you look at like fees for boarding him, doing it that way, it, it just seems ridiculous. How much is it to board a dog? It depends. The cheapest we've gotten in L.A. is $40 a night. So it'll be close to $1,000 for three weeks. 
but a lot of people, if they're going to do it over Christmas, now they're going to jack that up fairly. Right. I get right. that. Yeah. So it would have been even more than that. Yeah, we got a a cat sitter. You know, cats are different. You just get she just came by the house. You know, just right. made because we got an automatic feeder and all that stuff. So it's like every three or four days she had to refill the water because the water works the same way. So, you know, and I don't even think she had to refill the food the whole time because the tank that it holds is big as hell. So it was pretty easy, but I still felt bad the whole time. She, you know, Kitty, thought, out we the cat. Was, Kitty thought we was all dead forever. And it had no effect on her. Yeah. She did not care. <laughs> no, I think she was sad, were. Her. She was sad. Wondering where your bodies it, were. It made her sad. Eat. She was real happy when we came back. Uh, that's cute. So. All right. So, uh, yeah, we drove. I drove back, though. I think that's what you wanted me to get into was all the places we stopped. Went to New Orleans. This was pre-Omicron. So that was like, you know, early December. That was a blast. Uh, I said we went to Nashville. Went back home. I know you went back home for the first time in two years. I want to hear about that, but we'll save that for a later segment. We'll just both generally talk about being back home. Uh, and then on the way back through, uh, we went to Marfa, Texas, which is this very rural area. It's about an hour off the interstate. Um, I've heard of that, but I don't know why. It's real well, There's something going on there. So they have a lot of festivals. So some artist, and I can't remember his name, something Judd, uh, moved there because like land was cheap and he liked the landscape. It fit what he did or whatever. And then it be, kind of became an art center. And then I think it's called Deer Dick was a show with Kevin Bacon in it that was set there. And it's very Dear beautiful. Deer Dick? Yeah. The, there was an artist. There was a character that Kevin Bacon played whose first name was Dick. And this lady moved there to teach. Her husband was a teacher and she fell in love with him. Andy watched right. the show. So it has Marfa Agate, mm. which is a stone that is only there, like a precious stone that people make art with. It's very Instagrammable because it's beautiful, it's desert, and as the art scene has put more money into it, every hotel there is gorgeous and wild looking. So it's kind of like Palm Springs with cowboys, uh -huh. but also very tiny. Very okay. tiny. <laughs> uh, how, like how tiny? Like how, yeah. how tiny are we talking? It has 2,000 people in it. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, that's pretty tiny. Yeah. And, and so it's a weird spot. If I'm honest, there was a big part of me that sort of felt like the people on the lake when we were growing up. Uh -huh. Like we're just in the middle of this rural place who does not want us here and is mad that we're here. <laughs> oh, but, but, it, yeah. Because I guess people are, the tourists be coming through there now, like it's a thing. Yeah. And that probably, yeah, I mean, I probably don't hit for that. But I don't, I, I, I mean, that brings in money and all that shit. Right. But I mean, I know that, yeah, the tour, the lake people in Salina did not hit for us Salinians. I mean, I'm right. sure it hit for the people that had the boat docks and whatnot. But yeah, it was definitely well, we a met, thing. We met Coach Buck and we hit for him. Uh, Coach Buck, taught there was trying to get us to move there was selling us on his school i guess they have a hard time finding teachers so they provide him with housing for 50 dollars a month uh he, he danced with andy all night he kept showing her pictures of his kids but i was watching he was also showing her old pictures of himself back when he hit i mean and he did hit he was like a world-class rugby player big old motherfucker buck was uh so that was a lot of fun uh, we played pool, lost money, talked shit, drank, had a good time. All right. Sounds like a good time. Let's, uh, you know what else is a good time, Drew? Uh, What's that? You know, taking care of yourself. That's right. So our next, I uh, want to tell you all about Athletic Greens here. And uh, they have a product that I use literally every day. I, I started taking Athletic Greens because I just uh, – I just don't do more good stuff for my body, really. I get on the Peloton bike. I don't do too much. Like, I ain't never really taken vitamins and stuff. I just can't, I can't stick with vitamins because I just, it's, you know, I mean, my people, if I take a pill, I want to, 
<laughs> feel something. But and vitamins, I'm like, what's this doing for me? But I know that vitamins are good and I need to be taking them. And athletic greens is like vitamins you can drink. You know what I mean? It's also good for your gut health. It tastes good. It's got an interesting taste. I can't put my finger on it. It's sort of earthy, I guess, but in a, in a, in a hitting way. It don't taste like dirt or nothing. It tastes like, uh, I, don't, I don't know, like uh, it's got like a smoothie type feel to it. It's pretty good stuff. What the hell am I even talking about? What is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you are absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery, focus, and aging, all the things. Um, for me, I get, I get, they recommend you take it in the morning before breakfast. I don't eat breakfast, so I take it before lunch. You take it on an empty stomach, then you eat the food, and that helps the, uh, the absorption of the things in it that hits. And uh, it's been hitting for me, and it costs you less than $3 a day. You're investing in your health, and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. It's cheaper than getting all the different supplements it provides yourself. You're investing in an all-in-one nutritional insurance. So right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into flu and cold season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash wellread. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash well, R-E-D, wellread, to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And we thank them for sponsoring the podcast. Well, you got, Drew, sleep stuff? I got sleep stuff. Speaking of being healthy, everybody knows sleeping is healthy, and it's very important to my mental health. And I well, was sent a matrix by Helix, our other sponsor for the day, and I've been feeling healthier mentally, physically. I've been sleeping better on it. I love my Helix mattress. Uh, I can't believe that I went so long without one. And, you know, everybody's unique. Helix knows that. They have def different mattress models to choose from. They got soft, medium, firm. They got mattresses that'll cool you off if you sleep hot. Uh, sleep hot. They got mattresses that'll help you with spinal alignment. And I know you're sitting there and you're saying, but hey, what if I grew up in a trailer and never had no money and I just got my first big boy job. So I don't even know what kind of mattress I like because I used to sleep on a shoe. Well, hey, let me tell you something. He uh, Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes two minutes to complete and it matches your body type and your sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. So it makes it easy. I took the Helix quiz. I was matched with the Midnight Lux because I wanted something that was firm, but also that would cool down and I wanted a big bed and they sent it to me. They were right. The quiz works. So if you're looking for a mattress, you take the quiz, you order the mattress that you're matched with and the quiz will come, excuse me, the mattress will come right to your door, ship for free. You don't even need to go to a mattress store again. We've been over mattress stores on this podcast and we don't even know how they exist or why they're there. Just have it mailed to you. Helix is awesome, but you don't need to take my word for it. It was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. It's been recommended by leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving sleep. And that's what it did for me. So go to helixsleep.com slash wellread. Take that two-minute quiz. Get matched to a customized mattress and have the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up. So there's nothing to risk here. It's got finances options, and they're offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows to our listeners at helix.com slash wellread. So go there right now, get $200 off, take a two-minute uh, quiz, get you two free pillows, and get the best sleep you ever had in your life. That's thank you, Helix. I, um, so Vagabonds hit for you. Hmm. <clears throat> <laughs> you know, I, I, I feel about them like I do most people. You know, generally I give them the benefit of the doubt, but uh, I have a little bit of untrustingness of towards them. You know what I mean? Like you, any of that? I feel like I could see you being a vagabond is what I'm saying. So well, I was thinking about driving across who, the... Who like definitely puts them on a pedestal. 
And I have learned through, you know, as you're with somebody, you change them, they change you. I've definitely done a lot more vagabonding uh, since being married to Andy. And there's some, there's some real positives to it. You know, I used to, I used to backpack quite a bit. I was younger. It was different. But, you know, when I lived in South Africa and Australia or wherever, there were definitely times where it was like, all right, I'm going to take off for two weeks. Didn't have much of a plan. Was definitely sleeping, like I said in the ad, on an old shoe, uh, renting the cheapest car. And there's something really romantic about that for sure. I think it's for young people or retired people with enough money to do it in the nicer beds. Um, But there's something appealing about it to me. Sure, we've talked about this off the podcast recently for some reason. I feel like we've had multiple because of the Lost Dog Street Band, who I introduced you guys to, and the guy who's a frontman of it was a hobo kind of by choice for a while in his life. And what was that dude's name again? Benjamin Todd. Todd, yeah, and he does hit that guy hits, but uh, so yeah, we've been talking about hobos lately, and but not on the show, not on the show, so like. There's still so there's still train hobos out there, like not just not just any old hobo. Like people are still riding the rails. That's still going on. Sure. So if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, obviously, there are people like Benjamin Todd who, well, he had addiction issues. So homelessness is always a weird thing because there's like a lot of schizophrenics, and it's hard for you to say they're homeless by choice, even if they did leave a home where their family would have allowed them to. Cause it's like, yeah, but how much choice do you have if the voices are, you know what I mean? With an addiction issue, you know, I don't know. I don't know if the person got so addicted that they sold everything and lost their job, or if it was just like their family kicked them out and they couldn't afford rehab. Um, I'm bringing that up because if you think about it, if you find yourself homeless And your choices are living in a box or like this old boy down here who uh, built him this. He, he stole somebody's like bamboo fencing and he's got it in the park. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Versus train hopping. shit shitload of that a while back. We had a bunch of that that we, I don't, I don't even remember what the hell. I think I hauled it off somewhere or something. He could have had all mine. but He might have, that might be who it was because it did yeah. look <clears> like <throat> the type that somebody would throw away. It was just getting old. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if you think yeah. about living on a train, and, and moving is probably somewhat safer. You only have to worry about other hobos. Yeah, but. And I guess train cops. And then you get to see new places. I was going to ask about uh, I, that. That probably didn't don't hit for the train people. No, you can't have trains so. all eat up with hobos and stuff. No, I mean, there's definitely train. So are cops. there train cops or is it just there's, like security guards at a rail yard? Type? That's well, there's what it even is. train detectives, though which is something okay. I learned about about two or three years ago. And I think that's more to do with like, you know, thievery's kind yeah. of a big deal when you're transporting a lot of stuff. I think with hobos though, I think a lot of them do choose it though. So I was saying all that about homelessness to say that I recognize that a lot of people right. don't choose this stuff, but I think with hobos specifically, there's a romanticization of right. that's what, train. That's what I was going to say is like, I know some are, are homeless, whatever, but I'm talking and thinking more about the like, Christopher McCandless, or I think was his name, but the the Wanderlust, the guy from Into the Wild, oh, that okay. guy, that type of thing. And so I I may have said this on the podcast, but if I did, it was a really long time ago. Into the Wild, that movie, which I know is based on a book, based on real life experiences of a, a real dude. That movie got jerked off so hard. Sean Penn directed it, I think. It was like Oscar bait and all that stuff. I watched that movie and I hated that motherfucker. The whole time. He did not hit for me at all. That movie starts with him ripping up a like $185,000 check that his rich parents are giving him or something like that. And it's supposed to be like, I don't know, admirable or something. But like, just I was like sitting donated, there. Watching, dude. I, I'm not right. I was sitting there watching it in college, just like as fucking poor white trash. Like, you motherfucker you, like, you, know, you know what most people would give to have that opportunity it's like no i'm just gonna go be a hobo i'm just gonna go ride the rails well, and die in an old bus do. in alaska and it's like well that's fine but I, i'm not i'm not moved by that at all <laughs> it, it didn't it didn't hit for me the, the whole thing didn't hit for me if he like donated the money 
first or did something positive with it first and then took off? I mean, dude, I don't, you know what? I mean, maybe he, I feel like he literally ripped it up, but maybe he did do something. In the movie, different. I know, I think you're right in the movie. I don't know about real life, but in the movie, yeah. I think he just was like, I don't want your money. Now, if he donates it, that's fine. I just, uh, I just, I don't know. I understand but the those people, lust that's, and that's, that's a, that's a subculture that exists, is what I'm saying. Still to that, there are people who do the white people, I imagine, who do <laughs> that type of thing still. And they go out and they voluntarily hobo around the country. They voluntarily I get ride it. the rails. I get the idea of romanticizing riding the rails because you're going to get to see a lot. And uh, your, your nemesis, Riley Fox, used to have a great joke about looking homeless and then the second part of it was like hell i want to be homeless they ain't got no bills they got nobody telling them what to do i think that he was kidding but i do think that a lot of people look at the vagabond hobo type lifestyle as freedom it's almost like piracy without the rape and having to get scurvy on a boat you know how does this how does this tie into like um i know you've had experiences with these people you go to like Sit in certain cities, <clears throat> Pacific Northwest. I feel like ate up. You've had experiences probably. with these people, you know the pores. No, I, that's not what. I, like, I have met people that are like begging. They're beggars. They seem to be vagabonds or hobos or homeless or whatever, but they look like the twenty-four-year-old version of me or you or whatever. Like they don't. They they're um. Like crust they punks. look like they got their shit together. They look like a normal young college student or something, oh. but they're but they're doing like you don't know what I'm talking about. You ain't run into them people. No, I've run into crust punks with you know, they look a little bit like DJ, but like dirtier and younger. And the crust punk scene is a little like the hobo scene in that my understanding is it's mostly chosen. And the idea is like you're thwarting, you know, you're you're rejecting all forms of this bullshit culture kind of thing. And then you end up begging for your food or busking, you know, which is what a lot of hobos do too. I think the crust punk and hobo world overlap a lot. I'm not sure about the world you're talking about. Are you just talking about people who just beg because they want to do that instead of work? I don't know. Really? I, I was, I was thinking I've, I have been in cities and had a person walk up to me that like, looked like a college student or something mm -hmm. and they start talking to you and it doesn't seem like it does not seem like a homeless guy hitting you up for change type they don't feel like that yeah but then it but then it they turn they pivot at, at some point into asking you for stuff asking yeah. you for money or whatever I've, they've got some kind of story that they set up that they then ask yeah. you and that's happened to me multiple times and i'm talking I've, about specifically with younger seemingly like what i don't know about well to do they don't look homeless is all i'm saying i have three theories on that and they're not separate they're all together number one i think you grew up poor in a poor community and people who are poor don't look as poor to you if that makes sense does that make sense what i'm saying you're saying these people they just are poor and i don't recognize it but they're not but they're not that poor probably maybe yet but also i think more people are becoming homeless currently with mm -hmm. everything that's been going on i think that's a fact i think that we're seeing the numbers and people are losing homes so maybe they're newly homeless so they haven't been on the street that long and then also homeless outreach is different and changing so i think that a young person who isn't violent and doesn't have a record can find a shelter to live in can get clothes that are donated. That's another thing. Nobody keeps clothes for very long anymore. So you can get newish looking clothes for cheap. Or if you're staying at the Salvation Army, they'll just give you clothes that are donated. You can get a shower, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that all that's combining to where that's what you're observing. You're observing somebody who has better clothes than a homeless person did in the nineties or on TV who is newly homeless. So they don't, haven't lost their teeth or been in a lot of fights or gotten hepatitis D through F. Uh, and you, you know, growing up around white trash, it just, they just look normal. <laughs> yeah. And me too. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Maybe. So, um, but you, y'all, you ain't got no interest in, or, 
What's van odd life? Van, van okay. life appeals yeah, to that me a different? little bit more than well than riding trains. Yeah, you're well, sure. Your car. Right. Yeah, a van is different than a train. Everybody knows that. But I mean, like, <laughs> I'm not autistic. Van, van life is separate from. Uh, is that a form of vagabonding? You vagabonding? I don't, I don't think vagabonding. So. I don't think so. If it is at all, I would say that most people in the vagabond world, as much as they would give a fuck to talk to anybody or comment on it, would be like, because van life, I mean, for the most part, it's rich people for the most part, because what van life has become is a hobby that's expensive to maintain because those vehicles are expensive. But I have been not necessarily interested, but intrigued by the notion of living in an RV Kind of like what Bobby, our buddy Bobby's doing. Have you seen Bobby's Mercedes van? Yeah. That's van life stuff. So, you know, it's that's an expensive hobby. Now, you can get on YouTube and find people who have committed to doing it for a year instead of paying rent. And obviously that offsets a lot of the costs. So many people did that during the pandemic, and it's driven the prices of RVs and vans up, that it's now also just expensive to do that for the most part. But van life used to be a bigger subculture, more of a subculture, I should say, where now it's becoming almost mainstream again because of Instagram and the pandemic and stuff. Um, but I have been seeing all these articles at the start of the pandemic where it's like, because the pandemic, people are considering, and it's like they're, the, it, the pitch or the way the article reads is like, people are considering alternative. I'm like, no, people are desperate. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of becoming the thing. I never, you know, I've been lucky enough not to ever have to consider it out of desperation, but it does intrigue me to have something you could live in and move around a lot because, well, like I said, I backpacked through Australia, I backpacked through South Africa. Most of my memories associated with that are very positive. You see a lot of the country, you meet interesting people, but you obviously miss out on roots and you miss out on integrating yourself into a community. Now, the last two years here in L.A., there haven't been no goddamn community. Mm -hmm. Can't yeah. go out even to a bar, much less, you know, I don't know, Little League games or whatever you would do as a parent. Like, it's been weird. Yeah, it definitely has been weird. That's true. So I, so I find it appealing. I, I, I could see myself doing it, but here's the thing I'll admit about myself. I would need to do it in a way that I can't afford to right now. Like, I couldn't do it in a van. I would want to do it in, like, a pretty long bus type thing. Yeah. And I would want to be able to stay wherever I wanted to stay, like the best campsite in Yosemite. Or I need a week off. I'm getting a hotel. You know, something like that. And those, so the campsites, those are expensive, too? Well, with, like, Yosemite, it's probably not, but it's hard to get. you got to book that shit a year or two in advance. Right. But with some of the private ones... Yeah, like if you're just because that's the other thing you talk about, like toilet and water, those things can stack up. What do you mean? What, what toilet and water go, go on? How's toilet and water work? That's so let's say you got an RV. It's important for me to know. So let's say you got an RV and it has hookups for for all that. And that's really not a bad way to live. But the campsites that will hook that up and have that capability, especially in a place you'd want to be like outside Austin, they're pretty expensive per night. You know, we're talking 80 bucks. Well, I mean, a decent hotel is 120. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Plus the fucking RVs are even used ones are 20 grand. The nice RVs are 150. How do you so find a place to park it every night? You know what I mean? If you're not paying for it or what do you mean? I, well, I'm saying like, do you have to have one of the, everywhere you ever drive your van, Mm -hmm. You got to have an arrangement, don't you? Well, I like mean, in I, I'm LA, sure you could get away with just parking it in certain places, but you're not really going to know that, right? You're going to, or you're going to have to figure out mm -hmm. where it's okay to park it on any given night, or you're going to have to have some kind of site or something that you've paid for and that you've planned for right. in advance. It seems like a lot of like logistics and stuff. It is definitely a lot of logistics. There are websites that will help you. And then obviously in a city, you can just find street parking and you're allowed to park there for a certain amount of time, but then you don't have the hookups, you know, and then that goes back to the money thing. And what some people do is get gym memberships and then they can shower in a gym. But like, I don't think that lifestyle should be too romanticized. Again, if you have a lot of money, you can work it out. Or if you just say, 
I'm not going to save any money, but I'm not going to rent a house and blah, blah, blah. I could see like a young family taking a really nice RV on the road for a year and it being a cool experience for those kids instead of sitting at home during a pandemic. But but having to live like that, people who have to live like that, it doesn't seem fun, dude. I mean, you, you drive through North Hollywood and Burbank and see them parked under bridges and shit. It, it don't look like they're, uh, you know, out there living their hashtag blessed life. Right. Right. Yeah. But I it doesn't, know. but I admit that it appeals to me. Um, so any, uh, any Morgan or Scott County shit go down or anything? <laughs> well, everybody I'll preface that by saying I didn't, I don't, I, nothing really did for me, but I'll still talk about going home in a minute. But what about you? No, nah, I mean, everybody got COVID, but there wasn't right. anything super spectacular go down related to that or anything else. It was pretty low key. Everybody hung out. Uh, Andy's dad didn't cry when we left this time, and that was a relief. Um, everyone's still trying to get us to move home. I don't Dude. know if you experienced that. Yeah, I mean, no, not really just me, mom. I mean, Paige, like my sister, she like, uh, she's got a new baby. And I mean, she's like, you know, she'll say, ah, I wish y'all were around, whatever, and stuff like that. And then, but Mayma, you know, God, she's 83 and pitiful. And she's just like, I don't know what I'm going to do when y'all leave again, you know, and all this. And she's already called me since we left and she's so sad and whatever. And it is a huge bummer. But it's like, even if I, I like, even if we did move back to Tennessee, man. I ain't fucking moving to Salina. <laughs> no, it would be nasty. That's just, that's just, that ain't, that just ain't happening. And, no. my, you know, it makes me feel bad. Sure, like, I enjoy being there, but I also feel bad. And also, like, the boys, my sons, they got sick immediately upon arriving in Tennessee. It was like the third day they were in Tennessee. They got sick. Not COVID. We had them tested for COVID twice. It wasn't COVID. They just had regular child illness just a cold or whatever it's you know the weather was fucking schizophrenic in tennessee over yeah. in december it was weird and wild it'd be 70 something fucking degrees and then up 40 degrees it snowed the day we left it snowed a shitload the few past few days right after we left but anyway and i think they live in california i think they moved there the weather's been weird and stuff and they just like got a cold you know but they had it the whole time i mean we were there we were in tennessee for like three weeks too and the boys were pretty much sick not like bad i mean they you know it was up and down but like they were pretty much sick the whole time which impacted a lot of the the plans and so we didn't really do much but we never intended to do that much anyway we just like saw people and, and whatnot but that uh put a little bit of a damper on it but it was still you know nice but yeah i mean people would definitely love it if we move back for sure one thing that i noticed and i don't know if you noticed anything like this is the context of conversations have been so long since i've been there i forgot how different the context of every conversation is so it doesn't even have to be political but just as an example of, of something like um covid my parents and andy's parents they're vaccinated they believe it's real, but but living there around people who don't is so normal for them, and it's people they know and love and respect. So so those conversations are very much like people who prefer brownies to ice cream, if that makes any sense. It's like like they talk about my uncle who refuses to get the vaccine almost like the way they talk about my uncle who prefers Chevys to Fords. I'm not sure if I'm explaining it well, but there's no, I, like, I mean, it's I not feel charged. Like I know. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I understand what you're saying, but I also can't really like picture what that actually sounds like. Yeah. So it's head. very, like, yeah. So it's very much like, um, <clears throat> like, yeah, the, We've got a COVID explosion at, at church again. And, you know, I. some people want your dad to cancel and some people don't. And I just don't know. It's like, well, do you think it's dangerous? Yeah, I do think it's dangerous. But, you know, some people just don't think it is. And it's almost like, okay, but you do. Yeah. Like, like and, and there's, there's like 
no anger towards those people, which I guess in some ways is healthy for a community. Mm -hmm. But it was shocking. It was jarring. Yeah, they, they weren't angry at any of the people who aren't vaccinated. They weren't angry at any of the people who refuse to wear masks. That's what I mean is being on the side of we should do this, but having no anger or resentment towards the other people like it ain't their fault. Right. Like what what could they have done? I don't know what you did. Right. Yeah. That's jar. Yeah, yeah, that's weird. Um we uh you know, I just don't Katie's family, they don't uh I don't think politics got brought up in any even like COVID. We talked about I mean, the boys were sick. We got them COVID tested and none of that was weird, you know, none of that was at all weird or anything. They just don't talk about politics at all and then you know, it's a lot of my people. I mean, we didn't really talk about politics either, but they're all on the same page as me, really. So I don't even have to deal with all that. I've got yeah. boys and stuff in Salina who are different, but because of and if people weren't sick and all that shit wasn't going down, I might have endeavored more to see everybody. But okay, that was right when Omicron was a uh, really popping off and the boys were sick, and everything, and Katie was real. I was. I wanted to like invite some people over and stuff like that, you know, but Katie was real apprehensive about that other than like a very small number. So I didn't, uh, I didn't really see people except those closest to me with whom I don't have any real disagreements for the most part. So I don't, I didn't even get into none of that. Shit. Well, it wasn't just politics though. You know, like I forgot how everybody going to church and I know you don't deal with that either was a given. Like, like the kids will be like, why ain't Indian Drew going to church? Mm -hmm. And they're not old enough to be like offended by it. You know, it's just, I forgot what it was like to be around people where it was like, what do you, are they sick? You know, so that's. So y'all don't, y'all don't go to church ever when you go back home? Sometimes I will. Like I do genuinely enjoy hearing my dad preach sometimes. Um, some stuff that's gone on in our families that I frankly, I can't get into cause I would out somebody that doesn't, that that's apparently not out, even though I thought they were made me really realize just how like just being there can be poison for people. You know what I mean? Yeah. No matter the context. Yeah. And that yeah. kind of got it. I got it in my head for one. There was a time very recently where I was like, I'm never fucking going back. Mm. But what I've just decided is I'll never go if I don't want to ever again. And I didn't want to this time. Uh, can we can we talk about that that text message you get involves family adjacent people in a gathering and? <laughs> I just, yeah, I'm I trying to remember exactly. I don't know how if that's cool down. to say or not. I just the way I remember it was you showed us a screenshot of a text from somebody in. Uh, Andy's family yes. I, that that then the text message it was a big group text to the whole family like 20 people or whatever the whole family yeah. and it starts it's like hey y'all bad news whoever Papa Odell got got COVID uh it's you know he tested positive this morning dot 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 now we're all still gonna get together later <laughs> obviously yeah, so obviously. you know y'all just come over if you're not comfortable you stay in the yard or whatever We'll put him on the porch, keep the kids away from him. But, you know, everybody be at the house at noon. <laughs> That's the perfect I mean, example of what I'm talking about. And and, and without yeah. making it political, there's obviously political undertones of that. But the whole, if you're not comfortable with it, you can stay in the yard. Was not meant to be like a challenge. It wasn't meant right. to be like, and if you don't want to be here, fuck you. It was like yeah. no thought was going to that. We're in a yeah. different world altogether. That's kind of what I'm saying. It was like I'm swimming in water. So, the person who sent that turns out to be patient zero. Okay. <laughs> Gave it to the papa three days yeah. before that. Told me that while we were having wine in the same room, masks off. <laughs> said, well, it's, it's been like it's day five, so I'm good now because the CDC just said it was five to seven days now. Yeah. Just wanting, to, and what it was was I realized with that particular person is wanting so bad to like, I mean, without a, not necessarily consciously, but what I realized to own the lips, like, see, it's not a big deal, and we will mm -hmm. get together, and we won't die, 
And, you know, no one did die because they were all vaccinated, everybody that was old, and they immediately went and got monoclonal antibodies, which is like, all right, so you do like science. Right. Just as long as it allows you to be right or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's talk about Lucy for a second. Y'all, y'all know Lucy been sponsored for a while now. We love them. Look, we're all adults here. Some of us choose to use nicotine to relax, focus, or just unwind after a long day. And Lucy is a modern oral nicotine company that makes nicotine gum, lozenges, and pouches for adults who are looking for the best, most responsible way to consume their nicotine. It's a new year. Why not start it out by switching to a new nicotine product that you can feel good about? So, me personally, I like uh, I like Lucy. I like what they got going on over there. They make something that tastes good, but also has utility. That's important. I like the fruit flavors they got. The uh, the gums are good. The lozenges, the pouches. I like it all. Um, my favorite thing about it, as I always say, is uh, the um, it's discreet. So, you know, I fly a lot. You get on a plane, you can't vape on a plane. You can't do that. You can't get your nicotine on a plane. They tell you you can't have smokeless tobacco either. I don't know. We got like a the dip police on a plane there. But if you chew a piece of gum, what are they going to say? Nothing. Not nothing. Put a lozenge in. It's like throat hurts. I don't know. It's a... Uh, it's the best way to get your nicotine and in, in, out in public, which is increasingly, uh, you know, antagonistic towards us nicotine users. So Lucy's out here doing the, the fake Lord's work for all of us, as far as I'm concerned. So if you enjoy using nicotine, you should definitely check out Lucy's products at lucy.co. That's lucy.co, L-U-C-Y dot C-O, and use the promo code RED, that's R-E-D, at checkout. As always, I'm legally required to give this disclaimer warning. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical, and an I try would add, which is. Remember, if you're interested in, in a better way to use nicotine, better way to use nicotine, visit lucy.co and use the promo code RED, that's R-E-D. And we thank them for continuing to sponsor the podcast. Back to you, Drew. I have a question for you, Trey. First of all, let me plug our sister podcast, Bubba Shot the Podcast, a 90s country podcast. Uh, It's full of nostalgia and irreverence. And we also got our good buddy, the Indian outlaw, Tushar Singh, to give us the insider-outsider's perspective, meaning an Indian who grew up in Alabama. Uh, And uh, it's a great time. If you like 90s country or if you just like us, you should give it a shot. Bubba Shot the Podcast. We release new episodes every Friday. Here's what I want to ask you. Obviously, in that podcast, and even more so on this one, we have gotten into country music, the state of it, the industry, pop country, what that means, what real country means, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think we will see, or have we already seen, an industry plant, an industry version of Jason Isbell, Sturgill Simpson, Margot Price, the alt country scene yeah. created its own niche and created its own fan base and created its own world when you and I were in college and right after college. Uh, mm. Some of our friends are involved in that. You know, Hayes Carl with the Red Dirt Circuit, uh, BJ Barham and American Aquarium, Sarah Shook and the Disarmers. As they've grown, the industry's recognizing that. Now, some of them have become industry. You know, Jason Isbell's a co-owner of 30 tigers and i respect the shit out of that but what we're also starting to see is the industry itself is recognizing the money to be made there and playing better music you got you know you got to give some credit where credit's due are we going to see a fabricated authentic or have we already First of all, this is kind of weird because when we were talking about bands and stuff earlier, I was thinking, okay, in the final segment after the last ad before we go, I'm going to bring up music. I'll tell you what I was going to say later. It's kind of funny. It's sort of ironic, the question you asked, given what I was going to say, but we'll circle back to that. Damn. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm surprised that it doesn't already exist. I personally have thought that what you are talking about would was – I've been expecting that to happen – for a few years now, personally, for Nashville to try to like replicate the whole Isbel Sturgill, Margot Price. Well, thing. one thing I know that maybe they good. have. I don't. I don't keep up with Nashville. Like yeah. maybe they've done that and it, it didn't really work or something. I, I don't know. But 
I definitely expect them to attempt it. Yeah. Well, one thing that I know that's happened, and I can tell you later if I haven't told you before who, but a friend of ours has been paid a significant amount of money to add authenticity to songs of up and coming stars. Yeah, right. And so I know in that regard, I mean, all Nashville really cares about is what's going to sell. Now, uh, pop country's still outselling the American aquariums of the world. Yeah. But as Isabel Star rises and Sturgill Star rises, et cetera, et cetera, they are going to recognize that, obviously. I'll go ahead and say, and I'll say their name, and I'll say their name because I think I'm wrong, so I'll admit that I'm wrong. I thought I had pegged one. I thought I had found a industry plant in our midst and i thought it was coulter wall and okay. i'll tell you i know who that why. is yeah but why'd you why'd you think that about him he's got an amazing voice and that's his main asset his first album was co-written uh you can find it in the liner notes by a full band that already existed in my opinion the next album the lyrics didn't even come close to being as good he his father is uh, some kind of senator or whatever the equivalent of is in Canada. Uh, so he's very rich. Now, he's a farm boy rich, so he's probably worked. You know, he probably had to work on the farm. But but he was probably the boss by the time he was 18, you know, telling grown men like, how to steer that cattle or whatever. So it shows how much I know, steer that cattle. Um, he probably steer cattle. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. His, first, farm shit. <laughs> his first album was Imaginary Appalachian. And that's fine. You don't have to be from Appalachia to name your title something Appalachia, but but he's not, is my point. Like it had all of yeah, the but ladies. imaginary Appalachia. Does that not? I would just he's Canadian, as you mentioned. I hear that title and I assume he that's supposed to mean like I'm sitting up here in Canada, imagining that I'm in Appalachia, or I'm, I think I'm, you're right. I'm channeling Appalachia with this music from Canada or something like yeah. that is what no, that no, I think you're, I think you're completely right. And I didn't even think it was anything other than that. I just, all that to me at that time, I was like, that feels very crafted. Mm -hmm. Whereas most singer songwriters, they just put out their songs. And again, his voice is unbelievable. And I'll never take that away from him. It was just like, so they found this kid who grew up, around cattle so he looks good in the cowboy hat he's got this incredible voice and instead of making him compete in nashville where being canadian is a huge strike against you uh which is ironic you know what i mean it's it's the fakest industry in the world but if you're from canada that ain't authentic enough or whatever mm -hmm. maybe they did this i don't think they did i think i'm completely wrong about him which is why i, did, I felt comfortable saying his name if, if you ever hear this culture i'm sorry uh, frankly, I thought you were too good to be true. So take that, you know, for what it's worth. Well, I Google Coulter Wall, and one of the first results is from Saving Country Music. It's a, uh, from a year ago, and the headline just says, I haven't read the whole thing. The headline says, Coulter Wall passed on Joe Rogan because he was working on his ranch. So, that I don't know what that, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, it's literally his ranch. Uh, that is daddy has owned forever, but there's nothing, I mean, you know, look, just cause you're rich don't mean you can't make good art. It was also the fact that his first album was co-written by people who've been around for a while, which is a very common thing the industry does. Uh, but I think that was just, you know, some people that liked working with him and vice versa. And, and it just so happens to blow up. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what I was going to bring up about music is I was going to say, like, I was going to, I mean, I know you still be, I mentioned this in the green room recently. I don't, I'm so surprised by this more than almost anything else about my personal aging process. But I just like, I just don't listen to music the way that I used to. The music I do listen to is the stuff that I already know that hits for me. Like I like I think about my my dad actually my dad was pretty good about my when I was a kid, my dad like he loved Third Eye Blind and REM and stuff like that. So actually really my dad wasn't like that at all. But I feel like a lot of dads, you know, they they just listen to what their shit was when they were younger. And I never, ever would have thought that I would be like that. But I'm only in my mid-30s now. And I don't know if it's a phase I'm going through or what. But, like, I 
only really ever I, I used to like seek out new music and try to keep my finger on the pulse of the genres I liked and stuff and was pretty good about it. And I cared about that stuff. And that's just all gone. And I don't know <laughs> when or how exactly it happened, but I just ain't got that anymore. Well, dude, I don't know why. A bit that I started probably eight years ago that I wasn't ready to do, or maybe there wasn't enough there. I've been wanting to circle back to it. It's funny you bring it up. Like I thought about this like two months ago. It was about how like that is your rite of passage as a, like, that's one of the things I think arguably that hits about being an old person is being able to hate all the things the young people are doing. <laughs> like fuck yeah. these kids is your right. <laughs> right. And obviously sure. you're going to be missing out on something. And that's what you sound like to the 18 year old is like someone who's afraid of change. And I get that. And there's probably some truth to that for most people. But I think for a lot of people, it's just like, I'm tired. Like, uh -huh. it's like, I don't know. I think you're better about this than me. I remember we've talked about this before. I got to listen to a song about four or five times before I know. If no, I I'm, really no like I'm, I'm like that too. I, I have to, like, if I listen, sit down and listen to somebody's album, I, ca I can't listen to it just once and tell you what I really think about it. I have to listen. And like, and yeah, that's the thing. That's what I, it's, I have to like make a commitment to sit and to do that, you know, and that's part of it for me, I think. That sucks. I get older. Yeah. And then also I think as we age, uh, things that we know just are comforting. I think there's some science behind that. I'm not super sure what it is, but it's like when the brain starts stops developing then you plateau for a little while and then it deteriorates sometime in the middle of that you just really 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 seek out uh comfort in things you recognize mm -hmm. but that's like a mushy thing in my head that i've read but i can't pinpoint where but I you be it. but you be knowing about new stuff still sometimes like what do you mean like i think i do in the i don't Americana know every now and then mark I don't know, you and Mark will be talking about some, it's usually some rap shit or something, and I'm like, I ain't got a fucking clue who they're talking about. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that, man, because this happened over the break. It's so funny you brought this up. I thought so, too, and who was it that I was talking about with my nephew? It wasn't Mac Miller. It might have been Isaiah Rashad. I don't think it was. It was somebody that I consider a young rapper. Right, and yeah. My nephew said, that guy, that guy's lame. He hasn't had a good record in years. Mm -hmm. And I went and looked it up. He's only had three records. But if you're 14 and the right. first one came out when you were 10, that's old as hell to you. Uh-huh. So, yeah, I might be a little bit more up on it than you, but I don't think in hip-hop I'm even close to actually being up on it. Like, Mac Miller is dead. And I consider him a new rapper, which is hilarious. Well, so like I heard, I heard the rapper Prof on a podcast. Ooh, I love Prof. And he hit. For, I know. Well, so I'm saying I never had no idea who he was. Okay. I heard he just happened to be on a podcast I listened to. He hit for me on the podcast, so I was like, I'll check his shit out. And it, and I, it hit for me. And then I put it in the group chat, and you're like, Yeah, Prof fucking rules. And then you start talking about Prof. You already have been knowing about Prof. But there's a reason I never for that. Heard of that motherfucker. Well, there's a reason for that with Prof, and you might try this if you if you have any desire to not become the old boring curmudgeon, which is I keep up with Americana country, like the stuff we're into. Like if B if somebody's opening for BJ in American Aquarium, I'm gonna check them out. If somebody's mm -hmm. on the same label as Sarah and I ain't heard of them, I'm gonna check them out because yeah. I think I'll like it. With Prof, Prof used to be on Rhyme Sayers. He got kicked off because a guy mm. in his entourage got accused of some really gnarly shit, and then he defended him, and Atmosphere Sluggo kicked him off Rhyme Sayers. But Rhyme Sayers Entertainment, I keep up with. That is a rap crew that everybody they sign, I have liked, except for maybe one person. Okay. Uh, that's that's where um, Prof, Sluggo, Idea and abilities. Uh, what's the albino guy? Uh, Uncle Sam, goddamn. I don't know. There's an no, albino you'd, you'd rapper. Him. Yeah, you'd know him. When I say his name, you'd be like, oh, shit. Oh, You're not talking about Logic, are you? No. <laughs> Logic's mixed. He's not albino. That I know. So I know he's not. But I thought, for a second, I thought you thought Logic was albino. 
<laughs> but I know he's mixed. He's very light skinned mixed. I was like, does Drew think Logic is albino? Logic uh, loves Sluggo though, for the record, who's the front man of atmosphere. Well, it was you were also saying, like, no, you know this guy. You for sure know this guy. And I was like, I don't know many rappers. Logic is huge. Brother Drew Ali. Like, okay. Yeah, I don't know. You don't know Brother Ali? I don't know nothing. No, this guy's old though. Brother Ali's from the 2000s, mostly. He he went on uh, Sway in the Morning in, like, 2012. My uh, my turlet just started making a funny noise. It's been acting weird lately, the guest house turlet. Also, we're at an hour, so I'll check Brother Ali out, but let's uh, let's go, I guess. All right. Um, I'm going to end this broadcast. See y'all later. Just Thank y'all for listening to the Well Red Show. We yeah. don't worry about it. We got to go. I do go. And the next week, if you got nothing to do. Thank you. God bless you. Good night, Ansky. All right. Hey, uh,